looking. Okay, you might just have to refresh. Uh, share. Boom. There we go. All right. Let's see here. Okay, so I see it now. There we go. Share. Share now. Cool. Cool. All right, folks, we got Matt Simpson on today. Uh, I'm excited to chat. Uh, it's a wild time we're living in right now. Wild, wild time. And uh, Matt's a, 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 a transformational coach. And uh, I mean, if we look at his Instagram account, he's a true believer in humanity. He's the author of Worth the Fight, a podcaster. Um, and he says here, service, work, vigilante. What's that mean? That is a reference to the, um, the service project that, that I'm very passionate about. Um, the, our uh, collective soul veteran healing mission, which uh, is healing the hearts and minds of our war veterans um, and letting them show the way into the unknown in terms of uh, psychedelic medicines. And uh, I've been advocating for the Heroic Hearts Project and uh, some other organizations that are doing incredible work with um, our war veterans that are, are struggling in a, in a uh, mental health crisis and suicide epidemic. Yeah, the, uh, there being a mental health crisis is uh, on the forefront of uh, the United States. And I'm actually talking to a lot of different people in other countries, too. I had a call with one of my clients in Jordan. Um, and everything that's happened with George Floyd, um, uh, the protests, it, it's actually uh, ignited the entire world. Even the Arab world is wow. hip to what's going on and are uh, becoming active in their own ways. And uh, when all this started going down, I was really thinking about it as an American thing. And I've definitely traveled to other countries and I've, I've watched the news uh, while in other countries before. And it's interesting what other countries get to see versus like if you're inside versus whether you're outside on mm -hmm. <laughs> how things are portrayed. So I was really, really curious. And, um, and yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> attention and compassion coming from all over the world. Uh, and I'm excited to talk to you today because you are a transformational coach. I'm a transformational coach. And, you know, uh, I've mentioned this a couple times this week already, and I'll keep hitting it is, you know, there's a concept of uh, as above, so below. And that is whatever's happening on the, the microcosm can also, it also happens on the macrocosm on a small scale and large scale. And when we look at the work of transformation, and you also work with people with PTSD, you know, there's the transformation and healing from really deep seated trauma what we're witnessing, uh, one of the questions I've been asking myself for years is uh, what I, I understand healing on an individual level. So how do we have healing on a cultural level? Because it, anything that can be done with, you know, anything that happens with an individual can happen with a group um, is the way that I've operated. And as I've been watching all of this unfold, I'm going, man, can we actually have healing as a group or does each person have to take on uh, the healing for themselves as an individual? Uh, so I, I'm curious about your opinion on that or if, you know, if, if you've spent time thinking about that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's a, I think it's a, a little bit of a, a little bit of both. Uh, and I, and I'm right with you on the, um, the, you know, things being, um, universal law what what's good for the micro micro is good for the macro and um you know the idea of transformation and uh like you'd said you know i working with a lot of people that do have trauma and i spent a lot of time and i wrote a book about about trauma and my healing of of overcoming uh, childhood sexual trauma and uh so so i feel like i have a pulse on the the transformational process of, of going through it uh on an individual level and I believe absolutely this is something that we, we are doing on a collective level. And um, the idea that, that uh, you know, we're, we're flushing out the trauma now and we're talking about it and it's exposed. And, and um, 
what is Brene, Brene Brown says, uh, the middle is always messy, but it's where the magic happens. And, and I feel like we're, we're in that part of the kind of that messy part of the, um, this transformational process where we've, we've had so many systems that are unsustainable and, um, you know, we've hit an impasse and, and now it's time that we, uh, we come together and, and, um, you know, find a way to, uh, make this thing, make this thing work. Yeah. Uh, every transformational coach I know had their own transformation, right? That's what, that's what fires us up. It's like, oh shit, I didn't know life could be this good. I didn't know that the stuff that I was carrying, I, I didn't know that it was voluntary. I didn't realize that I could actually heal that and let go and move on. Uh, and then uh, most people don't know that, uh, that whatever there it is that they're carrying is, is voluntary until they have the opportunity to let it go um, or work through it, however you want to think about it. <clears throat> and then it's like, oh shit. Uh, so uh, what I, what I'm, what I just picked up on here is, uh, we, we need people that have been through major transformation at the forefront of this conversation. I, my experience, uh, a lot of the loudest voices I hear, uh, don't really understand healing. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of things which is fine, you know, that, that like anger and an acknowledgement and awareness that there's a problem is an absolutely necessary step. And there's a point where let's, let's start highlighting the people like yourself who've had a transformational experience themselves, because until you've, until you've done that work on you, I mean, that's how you really understand how to help other people. It's one thing to read a book, go to school or become a psychologist or whatever it is. And it's another thing to have have gone through your own transformational process and go, Oh, I actually get it now. I understand the power here in the process. Absolutely. And it's, it's, uh, Marcus Aurelius is, uh, the obstacle is the way, uh, what stands in the way becomes the way the impediment, the impediment to action advances action. And, um, so on my personal journey, yeah, there was, there was, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of hours that were, 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 you know, where I was sitting in, in, in prayer, in meditation, trying to figure out my own shit and, and wrap my hands around uh, my own healing. And, and yeah, you know, through that process, we, we learn a little bit about uh, the uh, process and how this can, and how this can scale. Yeah, there, there are some universal pro, uh, principles that, that you pick up along the way. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your own trauma and, and how you how you healed that? Absolutely. Um, you know, it was, it was, uh, my 35th birthday, October 16th, uh, 19 or, uh, 2014. I just sold a business. I was a uh, businessman in Chicago and, um, had done the whole corporate America rep race thing and wore the suit. Totally suit and tie every day, <laughs> you know, and, and, and nice shoe, all the, all the good stuff, you know, or, or it was good stuff back then. And, and it, you know, there are things that I don't, don't value as much now, but, um, having this, this experience to, um, that, that night where I was supposed to be celebrating, uh, the, this, this, uh, momentous accomplishment of, uh, you know, starting and selling a business, there was a, immense opportunity for, for, uh, for growth with the new company. And all I could think about was um, this path that I'm on right now, and how could I be of greater service to people that are struggling, people that are stuck in um, stuck where I was before. And I thought that I'd done um, my my work, and I think we all kind of think that we've done our work, and then we have a you know rude awakening. And and uh, was it was it was two months later, I was down in the jungles of Costa Rica, and uh, had a profound healing with ayahuasca, and um, you know, I took a, a year to untangle myself from the, the corporate America mess so I could leave on good terms. And, you know, I traveled for, with a backpack for 18 months, uh, with, with earnest intentions of, of finding where I can best fit in for the next 50, 60 years of my life and, and where I can be of, of, of greatest service. And, and I came across this, you know, veteran, um, healing mission, uh, veterans for entheogenic therapy at the time, and Ryan Lecomp, and I was thinking, like, holy shit, man, this has got to be shared. How come? How come I'm? How come I'm not finding out? How come I'm finding out about this right now? 
and 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 dude, see- every every person I know that that they they try psychedelic medicine for the first time, so I almost nine out of ten times they come out and they go, "Why don't people know about this?" And I'm going, "Well, you know, we've been trying to tell everyone about it, but like, <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah." So so um, what? I mean, the, the, I'm, I'm going to, I'll probably draw parallels throughout the entire show. I'm going to do it at least for now. And that is, uh, it's really, really common. I had that experience as well. Um, I think we're experiencing it in our, our culture right now, which is we thought we had it handled, right? It's like, oh yeah, we, we got that racism thing down. Like, you know, we changed all the laws, uh, you know, there, there was a black president. There was like all these things. But then you find out and you start digging and you get into the stats of things. And then you see this whole uprising go, no, we didn't. We, we didn't. Yeah. We made, we made progress. We made progress, but far from done. And so uh, this is, I, you know, ho- hopefully this is similar to your ayahuasca experience where it's like, oh, now we really get to put this to rest. Or at least we, we get to make a really big jump. Um, and I had that experience uh, in my own life as well prior to ayahuasca. Is <clears throat> my my dad had uh, committed suicide, and uh, this was like uh, about oh, yeah about eleven years ago. Yeah, it was 11, 11 and a half years ago. And you know, I cried at the funeral, and I it didn't. And my life transformed after he died. There was like a lot of like acknowledgement of like, oh, I was doing this because of my father, and and my life transition. I had a transformational experience uh, the year following his death, uh, and it, it propelled me in a lot of ways. And so I thought I had it handled, but then I go down to Peru and do ayahuasca, and the medicine showed me, it was like, no, 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 no. You, you kind of had it. <laughs> Dude, I, I had no idea like that might come up. You know, when I talked to the facilitator ahead of time, is like, is there anything that you might, that might come up? I'm like, I don't think I got anything. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good, man. I'm just here to optimize. I'm here to optimize. No big deal. And then of course my dad comes up in, in ceremony and I have uh, a, a healing experience that I didn't know that was possible. And so, yeah, I'm with you on that. That's, it's one of those things where um, this is where the medicines are really good is because there's so many people walking around going, yeah, I think I got it handled pretty fucking good. Um, and something like that comes along. You're like, oh, wow, this is, this is a big transformation. So what well, was it that, what did you feel like you had handled that, that, that got you on? Well, at that time, I, I, um, I don't necessarily think that I had, um, you know, I was, I was continually achieving what the American dream would say that that, that, that should be uh, adding more uh, happiness and joy. And as I was attaining more and more, I was becoming more and more miserable. And I was I, I could I could feel that I was disconnected from uh, intimate partners. And um, and and I I had had some success with psilocybin, um, and I'd started meditating. And this was just abundantly clear that I had to jump into the unknown and to, and to go down. And of course, uh, you know, there's no way to know uh, that that there's anything. You know, that's that's one of the hallmarks of this um, this experience, uh, this psychedelic experience, and certainly the experience with ayahuasca. That it's it's just it's not explain. You, it's ineffable, and um, and words do no justice in on the experience. And and um, so yeah, that was what was driving that drove me to go roll the dice and to take, you know, seven days off. I, I told two people, uh, I, I cut out the day after Christmas. Uh, I skipped a family Christmas and, and, you know, had a low key time with my mother. And I was just like, I'm out. This is something I have to do. And I knew at the deepest depths of my soul that this is something that I have to do. And, um, you know, it, it, you know, the first ceremony was, 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 was awful. It was, it was, it was horrible. It was just a very challenging experience. And, you know, fractal computer code and just a, I was a mess. And, um, but the, the, the second one was a really powerful, uh, you know, breakthrough and, and, uh, I could see clearly all of the mistakes and, and all of the ways that I was sabotaging my happiness and, and sabotaging uh, authentic human connection. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you were had, you had success in all the, the ways that people thought I, I, I had a similar experience. I was like, Oh yeah. Got the house, got the, the wife, the car, like, 
all that stuff. Yeah. You need way less these days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm way yeah. a lot less these days too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. So like what, what, uh, what, what's your work lo- look like when you're, uh, when you're helping people, like what kind of people come to you? Uh, often, uh, people that have, have trauma and, uh, are looking to, to, uh, take a different approach towards, uh, their, uh, health and being, And, um, yeah, people that are interested in the, uh, psychedelic, uh, the psychedelic path or, or the, the, this path of non-ordinary, non-ordinary states, um, and, and looking to, uh, have guidance from somebody who's, who's gone through the, the journey. And, and I have a, you know, I've, I, I'm privileged to, to speak, uh, and, and to speak openly, um, because of the public work that I've been doing with our, our war veterans and, uh, you know, and having written a book, a transformational program, um, you know, it's, it's something that has, has been attracting, uh, you know, folks that are looking to bring more flow into their lives and, uh, looking to level up their game by yeah. looking within. Yeah. Uh, what, what's that process look like when someone comes to you? What do you, like, what's that look like when they, to start with a phone call, do you guys leave the, you know, potentially leave the country for a retreat or what happens? Yeah, no, no retreats. Um, you know, we we, we connect and we outline a, a, a plan, a three month deep dive and, uh, really identify the, the dream of where we're looking to go, the reality of, of, of where we're at, the obstacles that are in the way. And, um, and then we start the, the process with weekly calls and, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a process I call, you know, mirror medicine. Is it that it, I'm, I'm um, just here to hold space and, and to listen and to, and to share my experiences and, and, and to share best practices, but never coming at it at an angle that I know what's best for somebody. I, I think that we all have our innate inner truth and um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, my job to help people reconnect to that intuition. And so they can see for themselves um, you'd said something that was really profound, all sorts of things that were, that were just knowledge bombs on our, our podcast that we did uh, a few weeks back on the worth the fight podcast and uh, about discovery that people have to discover these, the, the, these insights themselves. And when they do, it's, it's aha, it's, it's, it, it sticks. There's, there's a, there's a binding that happens and, and, and uh, those ahas uh, turn into um action and they turn into eventually turning into habit. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what attracted you to, to work with veterans specifically? You know, it was, it was, it was month 17 of this 18 month travel journey that I was on. And I was, I was, um, just, you know, I, I had just come across this organization and, and it, and it fit perfectly with what I was asking. And, and I'd probably asked myself, you know, thousands of times on, on this, this 18 months of, or 17 months at this point, traveling with a backpack of how can I best be of service? And then to come across this, this work and to, to realize just how much this, um, this work, this, this healing work with our, our war veterans. And the fact that we have 22 veterans that die by their own hand every single day, uh, 10 to 15% of our homeless are, are war veterans. Um, countless others that are, are, are mired in self-abuse and the opioid crisis and mess and the, the pharmaceutical mess that we have. And um, it just, I just felt a moral duty and obligation to stand and, and, and to share and uh, to channel, um, I guess my pain and, and my, uh, trauma or, 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 uh, drama in the direction of service. That was the, what made the most sense for me. It was like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm fucked up, but I know I can help these guys and, and I can, I can help. Um, and, and that, that helper high, that, that altruism helper high was, was one of the most profound, uh, game changers for me. Um, you know, when we're serving others, uh, our, often our menial problems kind of fall to the wayside. We get the proper perspective and uh, that's what I was looking for. And that was my, um, that, that service project that I, I uh, was really in on the front lines with in 2017 and uh, 2018 um, before we ran out of steam, uh, you know, no fun, very little funding in a, in a fearful climate, but with Michael Pollan's book, how to change your mind, having every, 40s, 50s, and 60s white person in America rethinking psychedelics. I, I, I think we're in a different time right now. 
Yeah. So, um, so that's interesting. You're looking to help people, but there, there's a lack of funding. There's, uh, there's been, um, well, there, there's two things that I've looked at when it comes to, to veterans that have been a challenge is, uh, one, how do you, how do you get them to come to you? And, you know, because I mean, there's the word of mouth and it's like, oh, this veteran work, I worked with, uh, with Matt and changed my life. But to me, like when I started looking at how do we make a big impact in the veteran community, which I'm very passionate about, uh, that is one of the things is a lot of veterans just don't even know that this type of stuff is available or they, they may think, you know, it's not for me. I don't really have that. But then when they get out, they, they're like, man, my life transitioning out of the military is hard. Um, and I didn't even appreciate how, how hard it was until I was getting out. And I was like, Oh, I looked back and I go, that was a hard time in my life. That was not easy. And I, and I had it easy, um, and compared to a lot of veterans, but, uh, so yeah, the two big things that for me is like, how do you attract people in and, and then the funding piece, because you're serving, you know, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the people who I serve, uh, you know, they either are like my primary business are they make good money or good enough money. I'll say that. And, or, uh, or they're working with me so that they will make money. So there's, there's a piece of that, but with something like veterans seeking healing, there's no, it's not about that. And so what I find is, is like, uh, you know, I, in my businesses, we charge what we charge and we do what we do uh, because that's what's necessary to keep the business running and to continue to be of service. But when you start getting into these segments of the population, uh, like veterans where there's not as much money, you know, uh, there is this, there tends to be a reliance on outside money. Uh, and so the people who are actually conducting the service, you know, end up in a sacrifice at times and it's just not sustainable uh how are i mean do you have a solution for that what, what's happening on that front those are are awesome poignant um insights yeah because that's that's that is so true um the 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 notion that there's i, I think that the conversation's shifting and changing now uh i see see an upswell of uh veteran organizations that are spearheading this work that are digging in um you know Jesse Gould uh, and the Heroic Hearts Project. I, I yep. know that you're connected with Jesse. He's doing incredible work, uh, fully in touch with the you know the sacred duty and responsibility that the veteran cause has to lead, not just for our warriors uh, amid a mental health crisis, but for everyone. And uh, as we lean out into the unknown, um, the uh, you know Worth the Fight podcast number sixteen, we had um, veterans exploring treatment solutions. Uh, our Navy SEALs uh, came out of the psychedelic closet. Um, and they're having tremendous success with ibogaine. Uh, you know, having uh, struggling predominantly with with addiction in their community. And uh, you know, uh, ab ibogaine, which I haven't done, uh, is purported to be the you know the granddaddy of of them all, and and uh, and and something that in a weekend will knock out addiction. Yeah, ibogaine specifically for addiction. Um, yeah. Uh, twofold, it, you know, from from a psychedelic learning perspective, people tend to get uh, insights into their life that causes them to be motivated to make change. Uh, but there's also it also binds to opiate receptors, so mm -hmm. and it changes it to where it's just the it uh it it can kill off the withdrawal symptoms. It helps with withdrawal from opiates, and it also uh like the desire to do opiates and and the fix that it the opiates were giving them before it dissipates. So it's, it's, a, it's both a psychological and a physiological effect. Um, I've only microdosed ibogaine. Uh, actually I've, I've, I've microdosed iboga. Okay. So, uh, but I've never done that. That's actually one of the few uh, psychedelic medicines I haven't really gotten into because it is intense. It's, it's, uh, it's one of those I've been, I've been told by many people uh, no need to do it unless you have a real problem. Yeah, I've no, heard it's not one of those like, oh, I'm going to optimize my life. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, sure. <Like, laughs> you know, it's funny on, on that account. And, and uh, I want to uh, answer the, the fully answer your, your question from a, from a moment yeah. ago. But, but uh, back when I was thinking of, of doing this, of uh, thinking about doing Aboga back in 20, 2016, 
I was talking to my friend Mandy about it and um, there was, you know, she never, this was completely out of character for her to say, she's like, Matt, there's something inside of me that is saying, do not go do that right now. You are not, you know, and, and I was, I had already done a bunch of work and I had so much integration and processing to do that it was, um, it would have, you know, of course we, we make the best, the best of these experiences, but, but yeah, it was something that I heeded that warning. It felt like it was, it was poignant and, and timely. Um, but you had said something a moment ago about, about funding and, and yeah, the funding is a, is a big challenge with this, um, this work and, and the, you know, being realistic about sustainability. Um, you know, I, I learned that lesson, uh, back with, with Ryan LeComp at veteran and veterans for entheogenic therapy when we ran out of steam in 2018. And, uh, you know, it was, it was something that, um, that I, I think I had some foresight and, and forethought on this, this issue and um, was why I was, I was in a, a position to, to hunker down and to write this book and, and, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm donating fully the proceeds of Worth the Fight to facilitate psychedelic healing in our warriors amid a mental health crisis and suicide epidemic. And, um, you know, it's been my labor of love to, to get this. And that's really why I started the podcast was to um, create a platform where we can have these conversations around psychedelic medicines, around trauma, around what our war veterans mean to our human family uh, and our great nation, if indeed we seek peace in this lifetime. Yeah. The, uh, you mentioned before, like Navy SEAL, like there being a problem with the Navy SEAL population. I imagine a lot of people, they think of that, that community and go, oh, those guys, they got their shit together. Uh, but I, I've yet to see a, a community of warriors that didn't have a lot of underlying problems. And I, I actually don't think it's indicative necessarily of what happens in training or even on the battlefield at times. It's usually uh, indicative of, of what happened before they ever got into the military. And then what happens in the military amplifies uh, and, and, and it tends to get a lot of the attention, but, uh, yeah. Can you speak to that? Like the, the, it's just, it's like reliving. It's like almost like, uh, being in the military causes us to relive the trauma. In a lot Absolutely. Of ways. Yeah. That, that's a central, that's a central, uh, point in, in, uh, you know, the podcast and the book and, and, um, uh, our messaging that, that notion of, and there's, there's these, uh, this, Sebastian Younger stat that I, I cite about every third or fourth podcast, this, this notion that um, he's got some pretty disturbing research in his book, Tribe. You know, Sebastian Younger is the foremost thought leader in PTSD, homecoming and belonging. And his research shows that um, modern day veterans that fought in Iraq and Afghanistan are two times more likely to have experienced childhood sexual trauma in the early years of childhood development than those that fought at random in Vietnam. And uh, mind you, I said report. Anybody, anything, anybody that knows anything about a man, you know, a, a soldier or men talking about a sexual trauma uh, with, with all of the sexual shame, it's something that is, is grossly underreported. And uh, that's well, something that we, one of the major differences between those two wars is one was a draft and the others were voluntary. Yes. So it, it appears as though, uh, you know, the you can think of the, the draft that it's almost picked at random. Uh, and and uh, you can think of when you think of two times more likely the of of having this childhood sexual trauma, it means that there's there's a subgroup of people that um, you know it it appears as though it's that trauma that that early trauma is driving people to go to war to seek tribe to seek community to seek the brotherhood because they you know when when someone has a garbled up nervous system and 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 trauma that has been unaddressed it's really fucking hard to, to connect authentically with, with, with our intimate partners, with our, our family, uh, with our communities, with, with everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't experience that. I didn't experience sexual trauma and I still like, and I went in the military and when I, what I recognize is a lot of the, what motivated me go on. There was, there was, there was a part of me that wanted to be of service, but there was a, a really big part of me that, was uh, using that to feel better about myself and prove to myself that I was good enough and 
and uh, valuable and all that stuff. And of course, never felt that way. It never, I, I never got the satisfaction that I was looking for until I, I just looked at myself and decided one day I made the choice to, that I was enough and that I love myself. And, and then at, at that point, all sorts of really uh, positive choices start getting made and, <laughs> and life starts moving in ways that are beautiful and easier and, and uh, you know, a lot more harmony really. So yeah, that, that's really, really interesting. So what do we, what do we do about the funding part? Um, the, 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 the funding is, is, is it's a tough one. Uh, you know, how, how do we, you know, it's $3,500 to put a, a, uh, war veteran through Jesse Gould's, uh, heroic hearts program. Um, that's a lot of money. Um, and, um, you know, I guess I, I'm, I'm in this narrowly focused, I'm going to keep, uh, and that was part of the motivation of, of me to, to, to pledge all of the, the proceeds of, of the book is, is to uh, get this message in the hands of, um, of our influencers, of the American people, of our artists. Uh, you know, I had Portugal, the man on, on our podcast before uh, a few weeks back and, and um, you know, there were 18 uh, artists that really, really inspired the work, um, mm. you know, this, this, uh, my, my book and ultimately this, this podcast creative project, the worth the fight creative project. And, um, you know, it's, I'm working full speed ahead to get this, uh, message in the hands of, of, uh, you know, people that, that have that ability to disseminate. Cause this isn't, this isn't, um, this isn't my message. This isn't our message. This is our human family's message. These are our warriors that are dropping like flies to suicide. And, um, and, and, that idea that uh, in thousands and thousands of hours of sitting in meditation, I've 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 come up with uh, you know some some and hopefully have have mapped some some um, what I affectionately call uh, bullshit incorporated. Uh, thanks, Stephen Pressfield. Um, of these these uh, BS Inc. Uh, energetic programs that keep the good people of of uh, the USA on the sidelines while their warriors are dropping like flies to suicide. And at the top of the list. Is is the church that perpetuates um, the, the the child the childhood sexual trauma that I believe is driving war, and um, and then of course our, our, our pharmaceutical companies that are uh, you know peddling opioids and and um, you know have have uh, really done some egregious things in terms of uh, setting our country on fire with the opioid crisis and uh, you know there's a lot of shifty business going on there. Yeah, so the money's there. It's just being directed towards pharmaceuticals and uh, towards other agendas, it sounds like, and, and really fueling things to make things worse. Yes. Yeah. I've worked with a lot of people. You've worked with a lot of people. Opio like opioids never help anybody. Like, like sure, if I, if I have some major physical trauma and I need to, like, you know, I got to be numbed up for a day or two to, to get past that or whatever. Like maybe, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, there's all sorts of drugs out there, but the fact that they, people are just writ being written scripts and sent home with opioids just makes no fucking sense. It's, it's so damaging. And the thing is, is if it's obvious to you and me, how can it not be obvious to people with, with a formal education? It's fucking terrible. It makes me mad. Yeah, it, it makes me mad too, and and um, and I think that that's why there's this pressing need to retell the story uh, around plant medicines, around psychedelic medicines, around trauma, around what our war war veterans are. Again, if we earnestly seek peace in this lifetime, uh, I think there's a big victim script that is around our uh, our warriors. Uh, you know that whole idea of of, of um, you know coming back. We don't have the uh, proper integration from war, you had said yourself that it was a really challenging time. We don't acknowledge that aspect and, and properly integrate them back into society. And, um, you know, it, the, the uh, indigenous and, and, and the, um, you know, would have a proper, a proper ceremony and, and, and a time to grieve and a time to come together and honor the, the experience and honor the sacrifice 
and uh, people could let let that trauma go then, and then they go they go on with their lives. But we we don't have that. Uh, so I think we're hitting it on all sorts of different fronts here, and uh, the idea that we have you know, MDMA assisted psychotherapy in phase three clinical trials with our federal government. They, they, um, it appears as though they have a cure for, for PTSD. If, if phase two results, uh, stand, stand up, um, two thirds of people that had chronic PTSD, an average of 17 years, they're working with the most troubled cases of people, um, are, are shedding their diagnosis after three therapy sessions. So, um, you know, it's my hope and prayer that that in time people will see the value of like, hey, you know, this is going, this is full on. You know, Johns Hopkins, our, our most esteemed institution, is raising their hand saying, hey, guys, these work for people that are hurting and, and, wow. and earnestly seeking to heal from trauma. And uh, you know, when 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 they're they're administered by people that are are holding that space and and there's there's reverence for these medicines, they're extremely safe. Yeah. Uh, MDMA is interesting. Uh, out, out of all the psychedelic medicines I've been exposed to, uh, MDMA uh, is, is one of the more enjoyable ones, of course, because it, it causes there to be a, a flood of serotonin, the happy, the happy neurotransmitter. Too. I think you're get, we're getting a lot of oxytocin too, that bonding. Yeah, yeah, the oxytocin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm actually careful if I, if I take that, who, who I'm with, uh, it, it matters. But yeah. Um, it's to me, MDMA just scratches the surface. And the fact that we're doing, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's uh, a lot easier for the medical community to accept MDMA uh, because it's, it's man-made, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a pharmaceutical in a way. And so it's like, oh, okay, we can, it's easier for us to grasp this and accept this as, as it does this thing. And having experienced a wide variety, uh, I'm curious about your experience with this too, uh, of plant medicines, like MDMA is nice. Like it'll definitely help uh, move through some things. But then there's other things like, like ayahuasca, where it's like, oh, that's like the amount of healing I, I've received through ayahuasca overshadows MDMA. And so we look at MDMA and go, man, it's super... Uh, effective. MDMA is very, just as you're saying, so effective with people who have what would be considered unsolvable PTSD, man. It, it, I, I love, we got our foot in the door with it. Uh, and it's just scratching the surface. Do you have the same experience of like MDMA is nice, but some of these other medicines are just like, Whoa. Yeah. And I think that it is, it's an important distinction just to, to say that, that, um, the success that these therapeutic trials are having, it's MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And it's the idea of the, the container, which is, uh, as Michael Pollan would say, white coat shamanism. It's, it, it, it has the set and setting covered. And I think that that is the magic of, of ayahuasca is just as much as the, of the medicine is, is this ritualized container that you have this safe place to, to feel and to lean in and to, um, yeah, yeah. To, to, to open up and, and, and to feel it all. And, and I know that, um, on a clinical side, that's the same model that they're doing to meet our Western uh, paradigm where the Western paradigm is. And, um, but yeah, they're, they're completely different. I think MDMA on a, so I've never had it in a therapeutic manner and, and I would be open to that at some point. I think that that would be something to, that would be, would be uh, a, a wonderful experience to, to have. And I've uh, heard many people that have, have had that. I've, I've never had the assisted psychotherapy along with my psychedelic use. Um, and in terms of MDMA, it was, it was, uh, the, I don't know, the half dozen times that I did that back in 2016, 2017 and 2018, it was all social, you know, I was at a concert and, and it was before, I think I knew better too, like you said, you know, but you have to be careful of, of the energies that you're around and the certain, and the people that you would, you would do this with. And, and I, and I, I, um, uh, I question whether, uh, you know, I would make those same decisions moving forward with what I know now about um, just just the importance of holding sacred uh, with with deep reverence of that that peak experience. Yeah, I, I've done a lot of different settings. You know, my favorite is a handful of really close friends, and it's it's nice to be with 
And I'm friends with a lot of people who've done a lot of uh, personal development work, psychology, things like that. So it's like you got a bunch of people who are in the business of helping people heal trauma and in the business of helping people optimize. And then if you're all on MDMA together, it's like a, there's this co-facilitation going on. In my opinion, that's the best. Uh, going to a concert, sure, it's fun. Uh, it, it, it can be enlightening on its own. Don't get me wrong. I've definitely had moments on the dance floor. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, that container is extremely important. And, and again, like MDMA being this man-made thing, it, I feel like it scratches the surface. We have, like you said, the, the, the people in white coats whose experience with these things are, you know, maybe a decade of experience at most, but I've also, I mean, I, uh, had the experience of going down and doing uh, uh, the woman I like to sit with uh, for ayahuasca. We actually call it Yahe down in Colombia. She's been sitting with the medicine for 63 wow. years, 63 years. The container and, and she built everything. It took her seven years to build out the facility and everything was done extremely intentionally. And so, uh, you know, if we just said there's a direct, you know, uh, it's like, okay, say you've been facilitating for seven years. Well, compare that to there's a 10x experience over here with someone who's, who's been sitting with the medicine for, for 63 years or 70 years. Um, and I've sat with shamans who've been in the work for 50 years. And I've sat with shamans who've been in the work for 10 years. And I, there's a difference. There is a notable difference difference and sitting with somebody with 10 years experience or five years experience or whatever it is awesome awesome always a really positive experience but yeah like i always like to talk uh let people know it's like hey if you want if you like that if you if you felt that was good find a find one of these uh and have some training before you go <laughs> have have a have that gringo training uh and uh that'll help you bridge that gap because you're right we have that Western paradigm uh, that it, there's not always a direct like, Oh, you know, I could just take my Western mind down here and sit in the jungle and everything's going to be okay. It's like, mm, not always. It's good to have somebody who's, who's played both sides before. Do you find that to be true? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I never sat with, with somebody who had 63 years of experience. Um, but, uh, you know, having, having diverse experiences, um, uh, with, uh, with ayahuasca and, and, and having, you know, the experiences in Peru versus the experience in Costa Rica and, uh, definitely feel like there's, there's a, a difference there. And, um, you know, so the, the experiences that, that I, that I had in Costa Rica, I think were more, uh, more resonant and, um, and, and that I had a more profound, uh, actionable awareness of, of, of next steps. And, uh, the last, last experience that I had back in, in Peru was a dude, just do your fucking work, man. You know, write your, fucking <laughs> work, do your shit. I don't want to fucking see you again for a long ass fucking time until you do your fucking work. And, um, and, and I was kind of dilly daddling around and looking for that and, and, uh, and, and really, you know, got roughed up in, in a, uh, ceremony and I've been kind of bright eyes engaging work, you know, that's since. awesome. And that's <laughs> awesome. I, I'd be curious, uh, you know, uh, I, I've had that happen before where it's like, all right, I'm leaving the medicine alone. The medicine told me, you know, like, I know what to do. I don't need any more medicine. I'm going to go do my thing. But then years later, return back to it and just experience like a, a uh, my experience has been coming back to it after taking a break and then going, okay, you've been doing a good job. Let's level you up. It's mm -hmm. like, whoa, that's i uh, I'd be curious about that for you. It's like, once you get yeah. everything stable, like the, you're, I'm, you're stabilized, you've harvested the experience and then phew, next level. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm open to that when it, when it calls and, and um, you know, I spend um, I've, I've really been so engrossed in, the uh, flow research of, of Stephen Kotler's work and, and Stealing Fire and the Rise of Superman and, and Mapping Cloud Nine and, 
and um, you know, still feel like I'm integrating the experiences uh, from 2016 and 2017 and 2018. And, uh, and it's been kind of my quest is to see, you know, how, how much I can stretch and how far I can push myself with, uh, with flow states and how I can bring more flow into my life. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was the ayahuasca and the psilocybin that first showed me flow and, and these, these, these peak experiences when I, uh, you know, had the, the, um, the, the, the 16 ayahuasca ceremony spread out over a three year period and, uh, loads of, uh, personal journeys with, with psilocybin where I would, you know, turn the phone on airplane mode and, and, and turn on the ayahuasca music and go within and, and really do a lot of deep cathartic work of, of, um, isolating my, my, my traumas and my hurts and, and leaning into them and feeling those emotions and crying those tears and, and, um, and so on. Very cool. Yeah. I, uh, I love that point you're making is, uh, you're taking the lessons that you got from the medicine and finding those flow states in your life. And, um, uh, yeah, I always talk about it as, uh, yeah, the, the medicine shows me where to plant the flag. I come over here, I plant that flag over in my consciousness. And then I go back, come back to 3D world. And I'm like, I know where that flag is at. Okay. Love that analogy. How do I recreate this in a way that is allows me to integrate it with my life and makes my 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 relationship to myself and relationship to others improve and uh, my ability to be productive and do good work, improve. And yeah. And then it's like, oh, that leads to like meditation and breath work and movement mm -hmm. and all these things. Mm -hmm. And if people just keep going back to the medicine to get high again, you miss the point. You got to do what Matt's doing, you know, go and find out those flow states. Cause so many people will never uh, be exposed to the medicine directly, but you're the carrier of that medicine, you carry that the carrier of that wisdom. Yeah. I love so, that. The, uh, and you hit the, the, um, with flow, I, the, uh, the breath work, the Wim Hof is something, you know, I practice every day and, and uh, gradual cold exposure and fasting, geez, uh, fasting has been such a blessing, uh, raw organic. It's one of my favorite of things to do, which is kind of crazy. It, it's, it's nuts, but uh, how good you feel, uh, on a, on a green tea or a coffee fast, Fuck. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, raw organic ceremonial cacao, uh, is almost that, that, that I found in 2018 is, is my, um, that's the med that's the plant medicine that, that almost, um, reliably puts me into flow. And, uh, you know, it's purported as the food of the gods and it's, you know, loaded with all sorts of, uh, you know, anandamide, which is, is the, the, the bliss molecule or the bliss hormone. Um, That's what you get hit with when you're doing the, when you get the runner's high. The runner's high. Absolutely. Yeah. THC also binds to it, mm. <laughs> but you don't have, you don't have to get all stony. The, the cacao is fucking magic. <laughs> it is. <laughs> It's that heart opener too. And, and you start feeling all that, uh, those, those, those deep feelings of romance and, and, and really romance with life and, and, yeah. and work and, um, just the beauty that is in every moment. This is why this is why a really good dark chocolate on a date. It's a good idea. Golden. Get, get that heart open. Absolutely. Nice. <laughs> All right. Uh, look, where do we? What do we want to leave people with? Is there something? Anything you want to say before we go that just you feel needs to be said? Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, and thank you again for, for, for having me on your show. It's been wonderful to connect with you these past uh, many weeks and, and uh, having you a guest on uh, my podcast, the worth people can check out the worth the fight podcast. Uh, my book is, I got a copy of it right here. Uh, worth the fight acting for a better world, a guide to spirituality, psychedelic medicines and overcoming trauma. You can find it on Amazon or also on audible. I did a, a an eight hour audiobook. And um, love to plug the Heroic Hearts Project. They're doing incredible work for our war veterans amid a mental health crisis and suicide epidemic. Uh, Jesse Gould uh, gets it and, uh, again, is in touch with the sacred duty and responsibility that our warriors, our war veterans have to lead not only for um, our veterans that are struggling too much, but, but also the American people that are very curious and um, wondering what the heck is going on with all this incredible news that is coming up in the psychedelic renaissance. Yeah. 
All right, Matt, thanks for joining us. Thanks for dropping this knowledge bombs. And, and uh, thank you for doing the work and taking action. Uh, it's, that's, uh, that's what we need more of in this world. So I really appreciate you. Thanks for joining us today. I'm a big fan of your show and your work and, and your expression. And, and uh, thank you for, again, for having me. And uh, it's been wonderful again to connect. Appreciate that. Peace. Awesome.